holy cow. Like, literally. All right, we are back in the middle of our Passover series. And hopefully you've already read Numbers 19, because we're going to be jumping right into this. And it's fitting that this video is being recorded in the middle of C-19 pandemic because we're talking about cleanliness. Yeah. Well, what are we talking about specifically? Well, we're looking at Numbers 19 where it talks about the red heifer. What is a red heifer? It is a female cow that is reddish brown in color. And it's reddish brown, we know, because the word for red in Hebrew comes from the same root for man, which means from the dust, so we know earth-colored, reddish brown. Well, our red heifers rare, because the passage kind of seems to make it seem like they might be rare, and in one sense, no. There are a lot of red heifers. It's finding the perfect sacrificial red heifer that's an issue, because you have to have a cow that is at least three years old. It can have no more than two or three black or white hairs anywhere on its body, and if there's two, they can't be too close together. And then this has to be a cow that has never known work. It can't have worn a yoke, plowed fields or anything like that. It can't even have somebody have leaned on it because that would be considered work. And then this is also a cow that can't have any babies, no calves, can't have known a bull, must be pure. And of course, without blemish, as all sacrifices must be, a perfect sacrifice. Well, now this red heifer was to be taken out of the camp or the city by a priest, not the high priest. So a priest, takes the cow outside of the camp or city, slaughters it, and then sets it on fire. Everything. It doesn't drain it or anything like that, just burns it all. And while it's burning, the priest had to throw some cedar wood, a sprig of hyssop, and then some red or scarlet yarn into the fire. It would all be burned up. Now, when it was done, the ashes were to be collected and kept in a clean place, and then if somebody were to come near or touch a dead body, then the ashes would be added to fresh or living water. And then hyssop, again, dipped into this ashy water and sprinkle it on the home, the possessions, the people themselves who may have come near or touched a dead body, and it would make them clean. Those who refuse to be cleaned are to be cut off from their people, cast out of the community. So what about us? Well, from our birth, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Therefore we realize, by our own sin, we have been constantly in contact with dead bodies our entire lives. Our own bodies are effectively dead. Gross. But this points us then to Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 11. And Hebrews 9 is all about our great high priest, the one who offered the ultimate sacrifice so that we could draw near. So Hebrews 9, starting in verse 11, going through 22. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, 
Then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So how does all of this connect with the Passover? Just as the blood of a lamb was painted over the threshold of the doors of the Israelites so that the spirit of death would not kill their firstborn the night before they were finally allowed to leave Egypt, we escape God's wrath and judgment of eternal death because of Christ's sacrifice. And just as the blood protected those who obeyed, likewise those who did not lose their firstborn, similarly... If we are sprinkled with the living water of the Holy Spirit, mixed with the sacrifice made outside of the city of God's firstborn, Jesus' body and blood, we are made clean of our living and death, while those who refuse to believe that Jesus died and rose again cannot be included in the house of God, the church. They are not saved they are still under God's wrath. Well, let's go back to Hebrews 9. We're going to pick up again in verse 23 and finish out the chapter. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Everything instituted from the time of Passover through the giving of the law was a shadow of Christ coming, and only he could make things right. Verse 24, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with the sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. We see the Passover connects because Christ was crucified at Passover. He was that red heifer. We see the scarlet yarn that is his blood. Some even think he may have been crucified on cedar. Can't really prove it. Doesn't matter. But we know we are sprinkled by his blood. And, you know... He only died once. We look at the red heifer, and they don't know how many were killed throughout the centuries. Some think only at most nine. But it's because those ashes could last a while. Well, so too, 
does Christ's sacrifice last quite a while, forever even, and it stretches back to the beginning of creation. We thankfully have a very holy cow. Seems weird to refer to Jesus' death and resurrection as a cow sacrifice. But we see the shadow. Jesus was the fulfillment. Obviously, there's more we could talk about. But now we know we have eternal redemption. We have life in Christ. We are made clean by his sacrifice made outside of the city. So that's what I've got for you today. Talk about it. Talk with family and friends. Leave comments on the video or on the blog, asimplemanofgod.com. Send your emails to together at asimplemanofgod.com. Let's keep the conversation going. All right. I love you. Bye.